Good evening, everyone. How was your day? Good. Okay. This is the last session. Oh, yeah. So, hello, everyone. My name is Roman Boyka, and today we are going to talk a little bit about um, Gen AI bad practices. Oh, no, this is for those guys. I welcome to the session about best practices for serverless developers. And today, yeah, we will introduce some best practices and ideas how you can improve your applications. And today with me is my colleague, Ben Freiberg. Welcome, Ben. Thanks, Roman. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm a senior solutions architect here today. And let's dive right in. So, what are we going to cover today? First, I'm going to talk a bit about the, the meaning, the mental model of serverless and how that has changed over the past years and what that means for us today and in the future. Then, I'm going to highlight how service full serverless, so using configuration rather than code and managed services, can really help you get the most out of serverless. And then at the end, or at halfway through, I should say, Roman is going to deep dive into some fabulous functions. So serverless, what does that actually mean? And I think we commonly think of the start of serverless when Lambda launched at reInvent 2014, so almost a decade ago. Um, but SQS and S3, which are very serverless services, launched even way before this, in 2006. So even before, we launched EC2 into production in 2008. That means the fundamental building blocks of AWS were built before we even added the ability to run servers. So in fact, you could say the cloud was born serverless. And it's only going to become more serverless as time progresses, right? As we add more ways and easier ways to run, to operate, to build your applications. So when Lambda launched in 2014, the, the industry created this term serverless. And it was really designed to help people get that mental model of running code without having to manage servers or infrastructure. But over the past decade, this, this definition, this meaning has evolved. It moved from just running code to much more. So today, many people I talk to have this mental model of serverless as being closer to delivering value for customers without having to manage some complex infrastructure capabilities. So translating to the day-to-day -day business, this means you're delegating the outcomes of building on the cloud to experts on those outcomes. So think about development in the cloud today. So you need an understanding of distributed applications. You need to understand how to manage performance, availability, scale. How do you handle failures at scale? Then there's the complexities of managing large fleets of ephemeral storage and compute. Or you also need networking connectivity to connect all those pieces. And sure enough, you also need permission constructs to secure them. But then all this requires expertise, and a lot of it. And over the past decade, over the past years, this expertise has become the norm. You just need to have it. But learning all of this, learning all this expertise, isn't what's delivering value for you, right? The value comes when you can actually deliver value to your customers. So when we talk about building serverless applications today, it's important that we evolved from these infrastructure primitives, like load balancers, instance types, networking, to application constructs, like queues, workflows, functions. And I think this distinction is where some people miss the full value proposition of serverless 
when we talk about, yeah, there's less infrastructure to manage. So I'd rather like you to consider serverless as a strategic mindset, just as an approach to building applications. And the events of the past couple of years and the economic environment we're in right now have really sharpened the focus on business value, on efficiency, on speed, when delivering value for you and your business and your customers. So today, serverless can be more thought of this operational model of being able to run and build applications without having to focus on the undifferentiated heavy lifting of managing low-level infrastructure. And this allows you to build what I call building within the cloud, taking advantage of the features, the, uh, the scale, the security, the agility, instead of building just on top of the cloud with using abstractions that make you do even more work. Well, then the benefits are clear. Right? You're, you're faster in getting your apps from prototype to production. You're getting faster feedback, which allows you to iterate more quickly. So how do you actually get this, all the benefits of serverless, the full benefit of serverless? Well, this is where service full serverless comes in. And what we mean is that you use configuration rather than code. You try to use managed services and features whenever possible. So let's do a, a, a very simple example. This is a serverless application. It, it uses Lambda, which you can, as you know, can be uh, written in many programming languages. You can bring your own runtime. There's an event source that triggers this function. That's a change, that is a request. And then the function does some processing and maybe sends it off to another service. This is the very common Lambda-based serverless application. But what if, what if we could actually remove that function right, and have the event source talk directly to the destination service? Right? So you wouldn't have to maintain your code. You wouldn't need to upgrade it. You wouldn't even need to pay for the function. Right? This is a direct service integration, being service full. And on the topic of when to actually use a Lambda function, here's a great quote from one of the fathers of Lambda, AJ Nair, which basically says, you should only use a Lambda function when you're actually transforming the data, not just to transport it. Right? There's probably better ways to do this. And another way to think about it is how much logic are you actually squeezing in your Lambda function? Eh? Are you trying to add more and more functionality? Are you having more if, then, else, like whole decision trees in your code? Um, and it becomes really hard to manage. And that's what we call a Lambda list, right? It's large, it's unwieldy. And I think a good indication is the level of indentation in your code, right? With every level of indenta indentation, there's more stuff you need to test, more stuff you need to secure, there's more complexity, more code. Right? So try to reduce this. Right? This is a bad sign if there's so many levels of indentation. But there's also the other way around. Right? So for how little logic are you actually invoking your Lambda function? Right? So how much business logic is actually in your function? How much other stuff is around it? Right? So how much is this actually needed? Are you trying to implement error handling, retries, throttling, all in code? Right? Sure, you can, but that's, that adds complexity, that adds stuff that needs to be tested, that is stuff that needs to be secured. And don't get me wrong, right? this usually starts with good intentions. Right? So you're, you have an application that sits in a VM, in a container, or maybe on-prem, and it has all these components, all this functionality in one place. And then you decide to move to the cloud. And you wisely choose Lambda for your compute. Okay, you add an API, an API in front of it, you have some storage. But what happened is all those components and all this complexity just move to your Lambda function. 
But what you should be really doing is migrating those components to dedicated services, uh, each one the best for their job. Right, so for example, move your front end to S3, add an API gateway in front of it, and then have that handle your auth, your caching, your routing, maybe your throttling. Use messaging services, hopefully asynchronously, and offload transactions to a workflow and use the service native, the built-in error handling and retry capabilities. Yeah, and sure, also split your Lambda functions into targeted, discrete components. This not only helps your application scale, right, it provides also higher resilience, improved security, and lower cost. Right, so, as part of this. It helps if you can make your functions more modular and single purpose, if you can. Right, so rather than having one large function that does a whole lot of things, rather have multiple ones that do one thing each. Right, here in this example, we have an image processing function that changes the file format, it creates a thumbnail, and it adds it to a database. Right, so when we split this up into individual functions, it improves performance because we only need to load the code that we actually need for this specific task. Uh, but it also improves security, right? As you can scope down the policies of each function to all that what it only needs to do. Right, so and taking the, the another perspective, right? Operationally, it's really convenient to have an API gateway that just catches any requests forwards it to a Lambda function, and then in code, you decide based on query URL, method, parameters, and so on, what to actually do. Right, so operationally, this is great. One resource to manage. Right, but from a security perspective, also from a how many resources you assign, and performance, that is all applied on this one big function level. That's probably not the best. Well, you can Think about splitting up your functions. Right? This is an extreme example where we have a function per API route, which again has the benefit of being very granular, meaning you can also uh, attach very granular IAM permissions. You can scale very individually, but operationally, this is a lot to manage. So, the idea is to be more pragmatic about this, right? Like for web apps, for other applications, um, you need to be pr pragmatic about how you group your functions into components, into groups that you can actually manage. Right? Too many functions is a nightmare to manage. Uh, just one function is really, from a resource and security perspective, can cause issues. Right? But how to group your functions, that depends on your use case. Right? There are some indications. Right? Maybe you have a bounded context. Maybe you have domains that just naturally belong to each other. Maybe the team organization influences it. Or you think about IAM permissions. So what are mutating um, operations where it's just ones that just read the data, for example. Right? Or common dependencies that you want to bundle together. Maybe that is uh, an option for you to, to group your functions. But somewhere there, you get the best of both worlds. Right? Effective permission and resource management and the operational simplicity. But don't forget right, the, the cheapest and the best performing Lambda function is still one you remove and replace with a direct service integration. And a good place to start is, for example, step functions. Right, so you have the state machine here that does uh, quite a bit of logic using Lambda functions, but they're pretty much just invoking other AWS services. So you can optimize this by using SDK integrations like this. Now, you implement the same business logic, but without having to run and pay for your functions. Right. And obviously, you can mix and match. Right? You can gradually transition over. You have full control of how you implement your workflow. Another 
great area is API Gateway. Right? It's a common pattern to have Lambda functions that proxy the incoming requests to a downstream service. Well, you can optimize that as well. You can configure API Gateway using Velocity templates to directly call multiple AWS servers such as DynamoDB, SQL, Step Functions, and many more. Once again, no Lambda function needed, no code to maintain, to upgrade, to secure, to test, and also not to pay for. Another example. Right? It's a common pattern to use an, a Lambda function to consume a DynamoDB change uh, events and then forward it to an event, uh, event bridge bus. Well, again, you can use event bridge pipe to take care of this for you. It's part of the event bridge family, which allows you to do the same operation, but just with configuration rather than code. Right, so you configure the pipe to read from, the, uh, from DynamoDB, and then there's a built-in integration to send these events uh, to an event bus. And the pipe that actually uses the same um, a, uh, polling mechanism as the Lambda event source mapper. So, but the code that you use, the code that moves the data, is now handled for you. So you manage configuration, right? That doesn't need security patching or maintenance. That's also another uh, area. When we talk about serverless, we talk about speed, right? Well, we can also talk about how much you can deliver. And AI is a great area, right? So when we are combining the speed of serverless, the ability to quickly iterate, to get applications fast out to your customers, and you combine this with the power of AI, what you get is basically really rapid delivery of even smarter applications and features with a focus on innovation. Right. But in the end, it's all an endpoint. That means you can use something like, again, step functions to orchestrate your, your chatbot, for example, using prompt chaining to generate really high quality results. Because again, it, it is an endpoint, you can just manage it like anything else. Before I hand over, I just want to really drive home the point that service full serverless means r using configuration rather than code leveraging managed services and features whenever you can, get rid of any code that you need to maintain, that you need to test, secure, uh, and pay for. And with that, over to Roman. Okay. Although Ben encouraged you to use Lambda functions as little as possible, Still, there are some business logic and some business rules you need to implement, and there's no way you can do that with all that integrations, uh, with all that AWS services. Still, sometimes you will need to write a code, and you need something where this code will uh, run. And yeah, Lambda is uh, the best choice. And usually I uh, tell my customers and tell my um, uh, customers with whom I talk that you can treat Lambda as a compute event-based model. So you just can get events from different sources. It can be synchronous invocation, but still it's an uh, event. It can be asynchronous or it can be poll-based, which I like the most because now uh, you can consume events from different sources like DynamoDB streams, like SQS, like Kinesis, like Kafka, and you don't need to code anything how you consume those events. You only need to write the business logic how you process those events, which is pretty nice. Also, sometimes you can uh, also simplify this and sometimes you need only like an HTTP endpoint, uh, a simple endpoint, just to invoke uh, some small Lambda function and implement, for example, a webhook pattern. With that, you can also get rid of another AWS services like API Gateway, and you can use only a Lambda function to make this uh, synchronous calls uh, directly with uh, Lambda function URLs. But now, 
let's talk a little bit about how you can optimize those lambda functions. And usually, uh, if you look at how and what you can configure for the lambda functions uh, in terms of hardware, there's only one resource you can do, it's memory. So you can uh, say, say that this lambda function will get uh, out of uh, 128 megabytes to 10 gigabytes of memory. But there's another very important thing for you to realize that this amount of memory uh, also uh, uh, allows you to configure under the hood how much CPU power and network bandwidth your Lambda function will get. And actually there's like a, a dependency between uh, 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 the amount of memory and uh, the CPU. Yeah, this graph is uh, approximation, uh, so don't treat it uh, like uh, the source of truth. Uh, there might be some steps uh, in reality, but uh, the uh, thing you should get out of it I is that, yeah, the more memory you give to your function, the more CPU power uh, this function will get. And, for example, if you want to utilize some multi-threading uh, inside the function, uh, given uh, your function less than uh, 1768 uh, megabytes of memory, won't make any difference, because, yeah, it, it will get less than one vCPU. And uh, another implication is that, yeah, if you uh, uh, see that you have like a CPU bound uh, workload, uh, even I if it's uh, like a single threaded workload, if you give less memory, that means that uh, the CPU cycles of this particular function will be shared be between other, f uh, other tenants running uh, 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 inside Lambda servers. So knowing this will allow you to find maybe a better configuration option uh, but there's uh, more. Uh, another very important thing, if you look at lambda uh, and uh, uh, the billing mechanism of lambda, uh, you should know that, yeah, there are two uh, ma main uh, factors, the number of requests. Probably here you can't do anything. The more requests you have, the more you will pay. Uh, but another very important uh, uh, billing uh, part is uh, gigabytes per second. And uh, it, it is uh, the duration of your uh, Lambda function running times the amount of memory you assigned. And here's the interesting thing. If you have the same Lambda function uh, with different memory configurations, uh, for example, one uh, running uh, uh, one function with two gigabytes of memory running for one second, and another function with one gigabyte of memory running uh, for two seconds, actually the price will be the same. And there's more. If, for example, you have two functions, one with uh, less amount uh, available of memory uh, running for 10 seconds, and another uh, function with one gigabyte running for one second, essentially uh, you will pay more for a smaller function. And this is also very important because sometimes I see customers, they think that, yeah, if I assign the less uh, uh, available amount of memory to my functions, I will pay less. But because there's under, underneath there's an uh, implication of how much CPU power your function will get, sometimes it may, may run faster and in the end you will pay less. Another interesting uh, approach, uh, how can you optimize and how you can think about uh, optimizing uh, your Lambda functions is uh, now we have two options uh, how you can run uh, uh, the functions and there are two uh, different uh, uh, compute uh, architectures, uh, traditional x86, but now you have uh, the option to run that uh, on Graviton2. And essentially it is again, quite simple option, you can just uh, have the same code uh, if it doesn't depend on a specific uh, uh, libraries, sometimes yeah, uh, if you want to use some uh, specific libraries compiled for a x86 uh, uh, code base, then probably you can't uh, use uh, ARM architecture, but in many cases uh, I I it's not the case, in many cases you can choose between those uh, two architectures and I it's like one nope uh, which you, you, you just uh, switch, and this allows you to get a better price performance configuration. But here might arise one question. 
Yeah, we know, now we understand that, yeah, there's like, uh, in terms of hardware configuration, there's only memory uh, setting we can t uh, tune and maybe, maybe uh, uh, the uh, architecture of the processor. But now, how can we find the best uh, configuration for our Lambda functions? And essentially, one of our colleagues has created this uh, open source project called AWS Lambda Power Tuning. And essentially, what it does, it does quite simple thing. Uh, you can configure, uh, uh, and under the hood, it, it is using step functions. You just configure uh, different uh, uh, configuration options for your Lambda function. So, uh, I and it will run uh, those uh, options uh, with different memory configurations and uh, in the end it will build you these graphs and in these graphs you can find what is the uh, the memory configuration for lowest cost and what uh, can be the uh, memory configuration for fastest invocation time and now you can choose what what matters m uh, for you most I is it uh, the lowest cost or is it uh, the fastest performance or maybe it's uh, some kind of a combination you still want to pay less but uh, get uh, the better performance and this tool allows you to do that uh, it also can run the same uh, uh, function for different uh, compute options uh, in terms of uh, pro processor architecture and then uh, you can uh, again have a good comparison and now you can uh, make uh, be sure that yeah uh, i've selected probably the best uh, configuration options for this particular function and yeah I it could be a g great starting point but again uh, in reality, uh, there might be different uh, things uh, happening so that uh, in reality, uh, when you go into production, there might be maybe some different uh, uh, traffic patterns or you want to uh, fi still fine tune your uh, Lambda functions based on uh, additional metrics. And there's another thing you can do. This is AWS Compute Optimizer. It's our native uh, built tool uh, and this tool allows you just to configure and get metrics and data out of Lambda functions running in production environment. And then it will also analyze uh, the usage patterns and uh, give you some recommendations if there are any, how you can optimize those Lambda functions. So there are uh, two types of optimization. First, with uh, power tools tu tuning uh, before you go in, into production, before you go live, and then with compute optimizer when you're in production. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, Lambda execution uh, environment and uh, uh, life cycle. And probably if you already uh, heard about Lambda or even used Lambda, uh, you heard about this cold start problem. But the only thing I want you to get out of uh, this slide probably is that we uh, analyzed uh, like uh, the whole uh, uh, Lambda functions running in production for all our customers and we observed that in reality only less than 1% of uh, uh, Lambda function invocations in production uh, are affected by the cold starts. So in many cases, probably it's not the big issue for you. Yeah, there might be valid use cases if you build an API uh, for front-end application and even uh, this 1% can uh, affect your customers. But if it's like more asynchronous invocation, asynchronous communication, then probably it, it's not the case. But uh, uh, still, if you want to optimize, there are uh, certain things uh, how you can structure and build your Lambda functions to uh, get uh, best of it. And here, as many with uh, different uh, AWS services, there's a split responsibility. Uh, if we look at uh, the whole cold start, uh, you see that there are different uh, things happening under the hood. We need to provision an infrastructure, create an environment, then download your code, uh, then uh, run some initialization things, and then uh, we run uh, the initialization of your code. And there are uh, clear responsibility boundaries. Uh, uh, the first three are done by us, 
and we spend a lot of time and effort to optimize those things. But still, you as a developer of uh, Lambda functions still uh, uh, can do some optimization things to minimize the cold starts during this initialization phase. Let's look at some samples. Again, it's a pseudocode uh, Lambda function and uh, it just depicts how you can build uh, and structure Lambda function following some best practices. So, first of all, for the initialization, uh, you need to input the libraries and uh, input the code. Uh, but here, be aware, don't import, like, if you have, like, a big library uh, and uh, there's a possibility, for example, in uh, Node.js and TypeScript uh, to import uh, only a subset, uh, import only the things you will actually use in your code. Don't input, like, everything, star or, uh, or all or uh, some other things. Another thing uh, uh, you can do, and I highly encourage you to do during the synchronization phase, again, uh, run some uh, common helper functions to download some configuration options, some uh, things which will be reused during all, all uh, uh, lifetime of this function. Then, uh, of course, uh, uh, for uh, each Lambda function, there's a handler uh, function, which is like an entry point uh, for uh, uh, your code and it, it will be invoked for each invocation of the Lambda function uh, coming from different sources. Uh, and the recommendation here is don't put a lot of things uh, I I into this. Don't put m too much logic. Uh, usually uh, you, uh, the only thing you want to do here is just to get the event, maybe to extract the payload out of that, that event and to pass this uh, data to your actual business logic. And uh, uh, I, I'm not talking a lot uh, today about uh, uh, architectures, uh, uh, but uh, essentially you can uh, apply some uh, architectural patterns like hexagonal architecture so that you can, mm, you can uh, split your business logic uh, running uh, outside your uh, handler and uh, actual handler function and then decouple it and uh, have a better testing and uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, if we look at some best practices uh, and some recommendations, I already mentioned uh, many of them. So don't uh, uh, load anything you don't need. So qu quite obvious, but I, I've seen that a lot when customers, they just import everything. Uh, do some lazy initialization of shared libraries. Uh, again, pre-establish connections so that you can reuse them later on. Uh, uh, if you uh, functions uh, need to uh, store some state and share I it during uh, uh, different uh, functions invocations, you can uh, again uh, do it uh, and uh, introduce some shared uh, uh, variables and uh, store that data there. And sometimes uh, you can use provision concurrency or for Java runtimes you can use snapstart. Again, how you can uh, uh, understand uh, uh, about cold starts. Again, X-ray can be a good option. W uh, if you enable tracing in your uh, Lambda functions, you can use X-ray and, for example, you can see this initialization phase for how long it uh, runs and uh, think whether you need to do some optimization or you're already optimized and everything runs uh, as expected. Also, if you utilize uh, some uh, extensions, uh, then uh, the, there is more on your shoulders uh, and there's uh, more things happening during the initialization phase uh, you should take care about. So uh, then uh, you, you when you use uh, extensions, then there will be initialization of the extension uh, and uh, yeah, obviously you need also take uh, that into account and optimize for that. There are uh, certain things you can optimize for different runtimes. Again, uh, I put some uh, samples for mo maybe most commonly used, but uh, again, uh, there is a d generic recommendation, don't I import uh, too much. Uh, try to use minification and try to squeeze the code. Because remember, uh, still uh, it is like more our responsibility to download the code into the execution environment. But 
if you make it smaller you make our job easier a little bit because now we need to download less and probably it will be faster so try to minimize uh, the code uh, of your lambda function so that uh, it will al also benefit you from uh, the cold starts but probably the most interesting and simplest thing uh, to do is uh, uh, to uh, look at new versions coming uh, into managed runtimes and sometimes you can only just upgrade the version uh, and get uh, a benefit of uh, uh, getting better performance so uh, tracking uh, of the versions uh, tracking of uh, new capabilities is uh, a good uh, practice and uh, it's easy to, to do, especially with Lambda managed runtimes when you don't need to uh, do a lot and you just uh, can update your functions to a new runtime and get some performance boost. Another uh, thing uh, I wanted just to talk a little bit, uh, it is uh, optimizing the login because I've seen a lot customers who do the login wrong and it uh, 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 affects uh, a lot their bills because they pay a lot from uh, for for example uh, uh, first uh, item I I in this list uh, uh, sometimes you want to produce custom metrics for from your lambda functions and there are two options how you can do that you can uh, either call a direct uh, put metric API on CloudWatch and pay this amount of money or you can use EMF uh, format and uh, just pay uh, this amount of money uh, for uh, producing the same amount of metrics. And uh, uh, another very important thing is to use structured login because again when you uh, will have some issues and you will need to troubleshoot your lambda functions uh, you want uh, to write some queries and uh, get uh, to the a problem as fast as possible and uh, using structured login will help you a lot and quite recently we introduced the support of structured login produced by lambda functions under the hood so you, uh, now uh, lambda functions will use structured login by default if you enable that uh, but as we develop all these functions and uh, all this code still we are now a uh, developers and still we have some things uh, to do with uh, code and uh, building this uh, reliable and uh, 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 s uh, secure code it imposes a lot of cha uh, challenges on us uh, because st still this is our code where we have to uh, have developers to write it first of all then yeah uh, we, we need to spend some time uh, we, we need to maybe all uh, uh, find uh, the appropriate open source library and uh, of course security and all, all the kind of stuff it, it uh, just uh, buries uh, the developers uh, are, are under this uh, big pressure and what things can simplify uh, your life as a, dev uh, as a uh, developer of lambda functions probably the most uh, uh, interesting and important one uh, is this open source library which is called power tools for AWS lambda and we have uh, implementations for different runtimes like Python, TypeScript, uh, Java, .NET and it's a collection of different best practices and uh, different things uh, already uh, implemented for you. For example, if you want to standardize how you produce logs, traces and metrics, there's uh, uh, libraries in Power Tools uh, which will do it for you. You just uh, need to use them. Or uh, there are a, a lot of uh, other things. For example, if you want to have like an idempotent uh, Lambda function, uh, there's a library which uh, implements idempotency for your Lambda function. So you don't need to implement that and reinvent uh, the wheel yourself. There are a lot of other things uh, you can do with Power Tools. So I highly encourage you, uh, if you don't use it uh, now, start using it today or tomorrow when you start uh, writing your new Lambda functions. This is the best thing uh, you can do. <laughs> Although th there are some other things uh, which may help you build your Lambda functions, yeah, well, quite recently we went J with Q Developer, and uh, I personally treat it as a new uh, assistant which can help 
and suggest sometimes good things to me, sometimes not good. Uh, but again, it's my judgment and I'm uh, in the driver's seat and uh, I still can make the decision uh, whether it is a good suggestion or not based on my experience. But still, sometimes it gives me good um, examples, especially for uh, easier boilerplate code, which I don't want to write myself. And uh, another good thing with uh, QDeveloper is that it gives you suggestions not only for real code, uh, uh, but what I like uh, more is that uh, uh, it also has some uh, suggestions for infrastructure uh, part, so uh, it can help you to generate CDK or CloudFormation or Terraform or whatever infrastructure code tooling you're using. So with that, you can also uh, simplify uh, how you structure and build your uh, uh, applications. And uh, I it also works with different uh, code tools, so VS Code, uh, even uh, uh, sometimes uh, still uh, you can uh, quickly prototype uh, maybe a smaller function in a Lambda console. Uh, and now uh, Q is also embedded there, so it will uh, give you suggestions there as well. So I it is quite nice tool uh, to have under the belt. Uh, there are more than uh, uh, we could cover today. And if you want to learn more about serverless, about best practices, I think the best uh, starting point will be to go to the, uh, this link, uh, uh, which is serverlessland.com. And we accumulate a lot of different resources there just uh, for best practices, some patterns uh, and uh, all other stuff. Also, if you want to uh, learn uh, how to build serverless and uh, uh, have like uh, a small uh, test in the uh, in the end Th there are two badges you can uh, pursue it is uh, uh, serverless and events and workflows uh, badges uh, you you just follow the course and then pass some uh, small uh, uh, test and uh, you then you can get those badges with that Thank you very much. Hopefully it was useful for you and l you learned a couple of things. And yeah, enjoy your time. <laughs>